Welcome back, everybody. We're going to talk about the ENT infections here. So we're talking about ear infections. We're talking about strep throat. Very, very, very common stuff that you're going to run into practically on a daily basis, especially if you're in the clinic in the month of October. Uh, so I strongly suggest that you pay very, very close attention here. If not for your exam, then at least for real life, because, you know, I have a lot of videos. This one, um, out of all of them, is probably one of the most important um, that you can familiar familiarize yourself with uh, for clinical practice. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And certainly feel free to subscribe to my channel and you'll get updates as I put more and more videos up. I try to do about three a week or so. All right, so ENT infections are super, super common in practice. Like I said, there tends to be outbreaks in the northern, well, actually anywhere, in fall and spring. And then when I said October a little bit ago, um, that's northern hemisphere. So think fall and spring. Uh, it's very important to remember that these infections can be either bacterial or viral. And you'll want to be able to distinguish between the two. And we'll get to how you can do that. Physical exam skills are going to be very important on the USMLE uh, to interpret what kind of disorders you're do you're you're getting. Um, so um, you know you're not obviously going to be expected to do any kind of physical exam personally because step two CS has been abolished. Lucky you, um, not lucky me. I had to do it, um, but. Um, you'll want to understand how these disorders are described because that's going to be how you get these test questions on the written exam. So this is gonna be what we're gonna talk about. We'll start out with sinusitis, we'll go into a couple ear infections, and then we'll talk about pharyngitis and influenza. Sounds like a lot, but we'll get through it pretty quickly. Okay, so let's talk about the offending organisms. So with acute sinusitis and acute otitis media, they tend to be, at least particularly otitis media, they tend to be bacterial. So if we're talking about a bacterial infection, either sinusitis or otitis media, the most common organisms are strep pneumo, non-typable H. influenzae, or Moraxella cateralis, particularly in children. So Moraxella cateralis, more common in children. 10% will be other. Now sinusitis can be viral. Okay, so I want to point that out. There is no such thing as a viral otitis media to my knowledge. Okay, pharyngitis can either be viral or it can be caused by strep pyogeny. So when you get a patient who has a sore throat, you don't know if it's viral or if it is bacterial. And that's why we get the strep test. And then H. fluenza obviously always... Uh, sorry, influenza always caused by influenza viridae. There are three types, A, B, and C. Conveniently named, they're all influenza vi viruses. Okay, acute sinusitis. This is inflammation of the sinus cavities of the skull. These little air pockets that you've got within your skull bones. Now, any time that you have a blockage for whatever reason, let's say you have allergies, that can cause a blockage. You know that. If you get allergies, you get a stuffy nose. Even that can be a risk factor because... Anytime you have a blockage somewhere, proximal to that blockage, you can get an infection. So that goes, that's just a general pathology concept. So what we would have here is a blockage, then a buildup of fluid, uh, and that's going to cause pressure and even pain. And ultimately, if you get an infection, the pain is going to get really bad. Like I said, most commonly it's viral. However, if this goes on for several days, more than 10 days, that strongly suggests a bacterial etiology. The most common presenting symptom is facial pain. They can have purulent nasal discharge, particularly if this is bacterial, stuffy nose, headache, and another one that commonly comes up is tooth pain. So dental and facial pain are very classic ways that they describe acute sinusitis. On physical exam, there may be some tenderness to palpation or just moving the head. I actually had dinner last night with a friend of mine who said, I think I have a sinus infection. I went ahead and transilluminated him and he indeed had a sinus infection. Um, so there was poor transillumination. That's a really good way on, phys on physical exam 
to uh, detect whether somebody has a sinus infection. This is a clinical diagnosis. We generally do not get labs to make this diagnosis. However, if you were to get some sort of diagnostic test, the best initial test would be a sinus CT, but we typically don't do that. The most accurate test would be a sinus aspiration, which we would then culture, but we generally do not do these things. It's a clinical diagnosis. The treatment is based on severity, so if it's a mild case, um, you can just do decongestants and steroids, so oxymetazoline and mometazone, both together. If they have more severe cases or this persists after 10 days, at which point you're thinking it's bacterial, then we're going to give uh, amoxicillin clavulanate. That is our drug of choice. So this is the, uh, the turbinates in the nose, and you can see here on the left, this is sinusitis, uh, but it is, um, this is before treatment. So this is how it would look when you first look at the patient, right? This is the inferior turbinate, so there should be two turbinates proximal. Now what happened here was we gave a decongestant spray and what you can see here is that it got a lot smaller. And that's a good thing because this is going to uh, clear up the, uh, the, the passage. So you're less likely to either develop a bacterial infection or you're more likely to clear it. You can see here, we can visualize the middle turbinate here. So we know we've definitely shrunk down. The complications of sinusitis are facial osteomyelitis. So we go from the sinus and now we're infecting the bone orbital infections, and even CNS infections, in which uh, we have gone into the meninges and that can spread all the way to the brain. So this is not something to mess around with. Okay, ear infection, acute otitis media, extremely common, especially if you see children. I don't, but if you see children a lot, you're gonna see this a lot. Commonly, this follows an upper respiratory tract infection. So you get a cold or something like that, and then a week later, your ear starts to hurt. That's because the cold predisposed you to the bacterial infection. Most prominently, it's gonna be, oh, what a surprise, ear pain. Ear pain, that is what you get with an ear infection. Common sense, right? They may also have decreased hearing acuity, uh, and that's because of uh, a, an effusion in the middle ear, uh, which of course is going to block conduction. Diagnosis here, again, this is clinical. So just conventional otoscopy, you'll see bulging and redness of the tympanic membrane. Technically, for a formal diagnosis, most accurate test would be insufflation and tympanocentesis, respectively. Now, the treatment for acute otitis media is amoxicillin. Very easy. Very, very easy. You can also do a second or third generation cephalosporin, particularly if they're allergic to penicillin drugs. If there is no response after three days, you will switch from amoxicillin to amoxicillin clavulanate, or if you're not using a cephalosporin, you can switch to that or another cephalosporin. Repeated infections, we would consider referral uh, for myringotomy. And what is that? That's tubes, okay? Tubes that we put in the ear. When I, I used to go up, I'm, I'm a good Minnesotan, right? I used to go up to the lake all the time when I was a little kid. My cousin had tubes in his ears. Well, I didn't know that. And when you go in the lake, you have to put uh, what amounts to silly putty uh, in your ears to prevent water from getting into your middle ear. And uh, I thought it was just silly putty. This is actually stuff he put in his ears so you could go in the lake and not get infected. Uh, and I was playing with it. I was probably eight or nine years old. And then my aunt came up to me and she's like, yeah, don't do that. Okay, uh, so this is what the tympanic membrane should look like. It's fairly pale, uh, pinkish in color, uh, and you should be able to visualize the malleus, which is one of the, uh, one of the bones in the middle ear, and your ossicles. You got a nice pearly colored tympanic membrane. This is exactly how it should look. Um, now let's compare this to otitis media. Well, this is where the malleus should be, but you can't see it. You see a little bit of purulent discharge here, uh, and then uh, you see some dilated blood vessels. You're going to naturally see a little bit of blood vessels, uh, but it shouldn't be to this degree. Here's another one here. So again, you see these bulging uh, 
in, uh, engorged blood vessels, and you see a lot more redness than you would normally see. So this is a little bit less uh, obvious, but you see again here these engorged blood vessels. Um, you can see the malleus here, um, but uh, this is a little bit less dramatic. Um, this is a little bit more dramatic. So you can't really see the vessels here, maybe up here. Uh, it's just the picture. Uh, but again here, you see this, what we call a donut sign. Um, so um, you can't really see it here, but uh, definitely here where you have this, I mean, it kind of looks depressed a little bit. I think I have a better picture. Yeah, so right here, uh, again, you see this donut sign. So kind of like that. Uh, that's common with otitis media. Complications are an effusion or mastoiditis. They're pretty rare. This is a pretty benign condition. We treat it with antibiotics, super common. Otitis externa is really just cellulitis of the skin of the external auditory canal. It is associated with swimming. And the reason for that is because when you're underwater, that water gets into your ears and your ears typically have an acidic environment. Well, when you get water in there, you get rid of that acidic environment. And just like a yeast infection, when you douche the vagina, if you douche your ear with water, you can get bacterial overgrowth. And here we're talking about Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Symptoms, pain. It's going to be pain. And generally the way you'll appreciate this is when you pull their ear back to do an otoscopic exam, they're going to say, ouch, quit that. That's very common. They can also get itching and draining, sensation of fullness, decreased hearing. We see that in otitis media as well. Diagnosis is clinical based on history. The treatment here is topical drops, and they are fluoroquinolones. So ofloxacin, ciprofloxacin, either are fine. When you do your otoscopic exam, uh, look for cerumen or earwax. If you have an impaction, you're going to need to do a disimpaction, typically with saline. Now, malignant otitis externa is much worse. This is a life-threatening osteomyelitis. So even though it shares a name, it's a different process. So this is osteomyelitis of the skull base. You should consider this in patients who don't respond to the eardrops, in patients who are diabetic or immunocompromised, or if they have this persistent otitis externa, like I said, that just doesn't respond. You diagnose this the same way you go about osteomyelitis. So CT or MRI is the best initial test, but the most accurate test is going to be a bone biopsy. Treatment here is IV progressing to oral ciprofloxacin, along with those topical drops. This is what otitis externa looks like. Remember, otitis externa, the other word for it is swimmer's ear. Okay, pharyngitis. So this is infection inflammation of the pharynx, surprisingly. It's usually viral, but it can be bacterial, and that would be with the group A beta hemolytic strep, aka strep pyogenes. Symptoms, sore throat, it hurts to swallow, and a fever. It's important to distinguish an upper respiratory tract infection from uh, strep pharyngitis, and the reason is because an upper respiratory tract infection is viral. So pharyngitis, strep pharyngitis, will never have a significant cough. Okay, so if you have a cough and sore throat, you're probably dealing with allergies or an upper respiratory tract infection, but if you got sore throat and no cough, start thinking about a strep throat. Physical exam, cervical lymphadenopathy is going to be in most patients. Pharyngeal exudate, we'll look at pictures of that. And then, of course, the absence of cough are keys to diagnosis. The best initial test is a rapid strep test. Very easy to get. The most accurate test, however, is culture. We generally get both of these at the same time. If their strep test comes back positive, we treat them. If their strep test comes back negative, you could have a false negative. We wait for the culture, and if the culture comes back positive, we treat them. Uh, now, if they're accompanied by flu-like symptoms, you should also test for influenza with the rapid antigen test, which we'll talk about, and mononucleosis. Looks very similar to pharyngitis. You get the sore throat, lymphadenopathy. So test for that, too, if, if you got flu-like symptoms, and that's the monospot test. If this is a viral pharyngitis, it's just supportive. If it's bacterial, we'll give penicillin, or for those that are allergic, we can give azithromycin. These, this is the modified Centaur criteria. You can see, again, absent cough, exudates, uh, nodes, and uh, temperature. And I just activated my Siri. I apologize for that. Now, 
if they're at the extremes of age, we consider that as well. So if they're age three to 14, we add a point. If they're older than 45, we take away a point. And then this is the likelihood of having a strep infection depending on how many points you have. Don't worry about this for your exam. Okay, this is the anatomy of the uh, upper pharynx. And so this is normal here. So notice you see a nice uvula here, um, equally uh, sized tonsils. They're not, um, they're, they're not obscuring the uvula. Um, so this looks pretty normal. It's pale pink. You don't see any exudates. It's not ugly and red and angry and inflamed, unlike this. So here you can see quite a bit of erythema and inflammation. The tonsils are fairly normal in size, um, but you've got a lot of erythema there. This is an exudate. So this is a dead giveaway here. Not only do you see the exudate, but the uvula is obscured. More exudates. Again, the uvula here is deviated, um, and that's because it's being pushed by the tonsils, which have a very obvious exudate. This is strep. I wouldn't even test this. I would just be giving this patient uh, antibiotics. Uh, and here's another one. So we have to treat bacterial pharyngitis. Even if their symptoms aren't that bad, we have to treat it. Why is that? This, and this, and this, and this. You can get long-term sequelae. Okay, remember, glomerulonephritis, post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, we want to prevent that. So this is why we have to treat it. Okay, finally, the flu. This is a systemic illness due to influenza virus. Everyone should get the influenza vaccine, by the way, each year. USMLE likes to talk about the flu vaccine. So there is a live attenuated intranasal vaccine. It's really good for kids and for even for adults who don't like being poked. Uh, but it's only for people under 50 who are otherwise healthy. Egg allergy is not a contraindication to the flu vaccine. That's good to know. The symptoms of the flu, I shouldn't need to tell you. Flu-like symptoms, right? Malaise, fatigue, you just feel gross, you don't want anyone touching you, you don't want to get out of bed, runny nose, cough, sore throat, red eye. Um, you should be aware of these symptoms. For diagnosis, it's the rapid antigen test. Um, so for treatment, uh, it depends on when they come in. So it's always supportive therapy. If their symptoms developed within the last two days, we can give Tamiflu, Oseltamivir, or Zanamivir. But if they're more than two days out from when their symptoms started, it's just going to be supportive. What drug do we not give for the flu? Amantadine. Why? Resistance. So oseltamivir or zanamivir. This is a comparison here. We have strep pharyngitis, viral pharyngitis, mononucleosis, and influenza. One last thing I do want to tell you, though, is that if you have a patient who's got flu-like symptoms, including a sore throat and lymphadenopathy, yeah, you might be thinking strep pharyngitis or mono or even maybe influenza. But another thing you need to consider, especially if you're dealing with a young man, is HIV. Uh, so you need to consider uh, the acute HIV infection, which is notoriously similar to the flu. So here's a recap here. This is your little cheat sheet. You can print this out if you wish.